Olivia Harsum, very warm welcome to the Digital Markets Research Hub. Many thanks indeed for your availability. Our hub is focused on digital markets, so most of my questions will be relevant mainly to the DMA um, project. Uh, but I wanted to start with a more general question. Uh, in one of your interviews, you said that you you wanted to be a, a, a philosopher. You, your parents were academics, uh, and so you you are open to to, to different ideas and you you have critical mind. So if you if you put you in the shoes of, of, of a philosopher, of an academic philosopher, how would you see the goal and the mission of competition policy as we are abandoning this axiomatic stage where everything has been oriented to price theory and measured by price theory and pro supposedly leaving to uh, embark into a much more diverse or pluralistic uh, coexistence of different approaches how would what would be your ideal vision well for me co competition policy is and has always been the tool through which sovereign powers intervene into excessive private power of firms so uh, that's why i i have always been contesting this uh, idea that is uh, predominant in particular mainland Europe, not so much in the UK, uh, that competition policy is a kind of Trojan horse uh, for, for neoliberals. Competition policy is exactly the opposite. A competition policy is really uh, uh, the tool of choice through which uh, you make public interest prevail over private interests in the working of the, of the market economy. Uh, and actually, if you if you're looking for a proof of that, you just look in the US and you will see that uh, uh, competition policy has been usually uh, more robustly used by Democrat presidents than it has been by by Republicans, uh, which kind of echo the, the point uh, I've just made. And second thing is competition policy, in particular, in this time of uh, great and rapid changes in pretty much every parameter of, that define our societies um, is also about protecting innovation or say, say it another way protecting the function of markets in the market economy to efficiently uh, allocate the scarce resources we have in order to try to maximize consumer utilities to speak as an economist. Uh, so, and that means that it's not only about price, because consumer welfare is many other things than price. It is, of course, price, but it is a number of other goods, including common goods that consumers value. Uh, and it's increasingly about innovation, uh, because innovation more and more shapes the competition and the goods and the wealth of tomorrow. If you think about it, for the first 2 million years that the human species was on Earth, not much innovation took place. Uh, a bit, I mean, the, the way we were uh, uh, using rocks in order uh, to make them knives or a number of other things, but very low and slow innovation. And in the last 2,000 years or 3,000 years, it accelerated a lot. And in the last 200 years, it's accelerated even further. In the last 50 years, a lot more. I mean, it's what, 70 since World War II. And in the last 20 years, even more. So the pace at which innovation shapes the changes in our societies has increased incredibly. And it had shrunk the lead time between the moment you the innovation takes place or the innovation is discovered and the moment at which it impacts very powerfully our daily lives. It used to be decades. Now it's years and it's, sometimes it's even months. Um, and all this is relevant to competition policy. And competition policy is about trying to stop the market with these innovation could be captured by uh, some uh, some some companies enjoying market power in order to strengthen even further the market power or entrench it. 
uh, and uh, innovation uh, would be also uh, used in order sometimes to protect milk cows uh, or, uh, or a, 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 a number of other means through which uh, actually uh, uh, market uh, firms entering market power could use the market power in order to uh, 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 capture innovation to their benefit one way or the other, and therefore to the detriment of consumer welfare. So I think this is what competition is, policy is about. That doesn't mean to say that it is about trying to duplicate the work that are done by regulators or supervisors in other policy fields. So I'm not in charge of protecting privacy. I'm not in charge of protecting the way uh, data are used or not used. I'm not in charge of uh, many other fields for which there are specific regulations, there are specific rules, and there are specific regulators. So conversely, I don't think one should attribute to competition policy too many objectives. I'm the great believer of uh, you know, the adequation between objectives and instruments. I think that when you give too many objectives to one single instrument, the likelihood is that you will you will be very suboptimal in attaining your various your various objectives. So, but that means that competition policy is a transversal policy that impacts all these various fields of uh, of our lives. Uh, as a follow up question. We obviously understand that the, the commission decides in college and the commission was never insulated. The, the DigiComp was never, in, or DG4, was never insulated from other uh, policy considerations. Um, but obviously innovation was, uh, or, or other interests, societal, particularly given, bearing in mind how, how quickly everything is changing following this kind of Moore's law or version of Moore's law, which you have mentioned. Uh, the stakes are increasing, and there are probably digi digital is being one of those uh, areas. So I imagine the, the the engagement of competition policy is getting more instrumental for achieving um, for achieving these broader societal objectives of e of European project. Uh, do you observe this trend? Is it rather implicit, barely visible, or is it just? Our kind of creative interpretation try tries to inject this instrumentalization of competition law. No, I, I think it's not instrumentalization in my view. I, I I think that we have moved away gradually from a narrow, essentially price and consumer based interpretation. Of, uh, of the function of competition policy to a broader concept of what is consumer wealth that goes beyond price cost relationships. For example, is uh, having a clean air or having a livable planet uh, something that participates to consumer welfare? Pretty much all around the world in, in, in modern uh, convention policy making, the answer is yes. Um, and of course, that has an impact on, uh, on how you design your policy. If you take the environment, for example, we have just issued new uh, horizontal guidelines that signal a willingness to be open to look at agreements that may have some anti-competitive aspects. But if these aspects are indispensable in order to reach a number of environmental benefits. So, and of course, every word is important. It needs to be indispensable. So you couldn't reach the same benefits without the restriction of competition. The restriction of competition and, uh, and the uh, beneficial aspects have to be proportionate. But it's not that you can have a huge restriction 
of competition for a very small environmental benefit. Uh, and the environmental benefit must be real, timely, and measurable. But if this, these parameters are met, there is absolutely no reason why we would not take it into account when assessing uh, the cost benefit uh, uh, um, analysis of an agreement between firms. So it is important and it needs to be taken into account. Once you have said that, you have said a lot, but at the same time, you have opened the door for many, many uh, new problems, like, for example, out of market efficiencies. So if you take a common good, a global common good, like uh, CO2 emissions, CO2 emissions, wherever they are issued in the planet, have the same impact on global warming. Whether we, the CO2 is emitted in Europe, in the US, in Africa, it doesn't matter in a way. We should reduce it wherever. So what about an agreement that would reduce emissions in China, but the negative impact on price would be felt here in Europe? Should we say, well, no matter what, it's a common good, we take it into account or not? This is one of the questions that is very decisive at the moment. Second question, should the consumers here in Europe, in my example, be fully compensated or is it enough that they are kind of compensated for, uh, for the restriction? And how do you appreciate whether they're fully or not compensated? Because however you take it, you're comparing permanently apples and pears. I mean, on the one hand side, you have a relatively quantifiable, relatively soon in time, negative impact on price. And on the other hand, you have a maybe more complicated to quantify, probably longer term benefit for environment. So what is your matrix to decide that the consumers are adequately uh, compensated? Y you will have to try to objectivize as much of the parameters as you want, but in the end of the day, it, it's, a, it's a value judgment. It's a value judgment that competition authorities will have to make under the control of the courts. So this is a discussion you couldn't have had 20 years ago. It was simply in nobody's mind. Nobody was even thinking about this. So it's not that we instrumentalized competition policy, it's that competition policy evolved as the rest of the world and the society and the markets were evolving and adapted. And we know that uh, some, some jurisdictions, some EU member states are more kind of proactive than others in this regard. And we also know that this, this question, question of incommensurability of different policy objectives and their correlation, con, kind of dialectical commensurability and simultaneous non-commensurability, incommensurability is the topic uh, which we live for legal theorists, legal constitutional philosophers, etc. Let us move to the Digital Markets Act. Yes. And so, um, my first question is about the also about kind of objectives. We know that one at the center of, of, of this new competition tool for digital markets, competition in broader sense, uh, was to create a more meaningful uh, uh, table for, for regulatory dialogue. And we hear two extreme kind of two extreme polarities where some people say that finally we will have the DMA where we will be able to enforce um richly abundantly there are so many opportunities to enforce the the the, 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 the there will be so many instances of non-compliance and others say that the purpose of the dma is not to create not to convert the rifle into machine gun and to produce endless endless um infringement for non-compliance decisions but rather to to to, to use this uh, uh rich competences as a as a nudge as a trigger for a meaningful dialogue where no circumvention uh, will be under the table where people will be sitting and listening to each other and try to calibrate this delicate 
model for the effective functioning of competition in digital markets. Where would you position your understanding of the DMA being one of the protagonists and one of the fathers of, of, of this project? Well, the, the first thing to understand is we made a, a very bold choice uh, at inception. We, made to, we, we decided to go for what we call self-executable uh, provisions in Article 5 to 7 of the DMA. Um, it's probably a bit of an exaggeration to say that they're self-executable. They need a bit of uh, goodwill and a bit of work to be executed. But what we mean by this is we decided to go narrow on the obligations, the super well-defined, precisely defined, um, on the basis of the decision practice of the Commission uh, under what they call uh, under the two, mainly, and the corresponding case law of the courts. This choice as an advantage, of course, is that it it gives quite a lot of legal certainty to companies faced with a, a regulation that is quite intrusive into their business model. They know precisely what is it they have to do and what is it that they cannot do. And that's the big advantage. The second advantage is that because it is an outright prohibition, therefore it had to be precisely defined, uh, firms uh, uh, I mean, it's it's difficult for them to not to do what they are explicitly prohibited to do, and it's easy for us to check. And that is completely inten inten intentional because what we have seen in 25 years of implementation of Article 102 is that Article 102 is perfectly fit for purpose when it goes to tackling uh, the behavior of platforms except that it will always be slow and it will always be too slow because of the discrepancy between the market time in particular in the tech world, in, which is characterized by huge economies and scale of scopes, huge network effects that deploy very quickly. So if you are in, indeed a gatekeeper, in other words, if indeed you control a core market that is essential to access a number of other markets, like your, win, your, your Microsoft and you control Windows, your Google and you control the search engine, et cetera, et cetera. If this is indeed true, then your ability to leverage that power and obtain a detrimental effect very, very quickly is huge. We are bound by the rules of procedures. We need to make our case. The parties have legitimately rights of defense. Uh, and these cases are complicated. So best case scenario, it takes us three years to make a case to a final decision. Worst case, five or even six years. When the network effects I talked about allow the company to actually kill the competition if this is what the leveraging was meant to do in less than six months. So we are bound to arrive once the battle is finished for a long time. And the only thing we can do is impose very hefty fines, uh, but the fines do not revive market forces. The competition that is gone is gone forever, and the markets are monopolized forever as well, and they're included into the ecosystem of the platform. So at its exception, the choice for the DMA is about this, is because we're always too slow, and because although they know the practice would be prohibited, because it was prohibited, similar practice were prohibited time and time again. They know there is no efficiency defense because no efficiencies were found time and time again. And they know that the court will confirm because the courts confirm time and time again. Platforms are continuing to leverage the market power in the very same way in order to obtain the very same effects. And the, reason, and, and the reason for this is that it was profitable. The profits from the monopolization were by quite a distance, in particular because they're achieved on a permanent basis, more important uh, than any fines we could possibly impose.
And the DMA is about making that stop by having an outright prohibition. But to have an outright prohibition, we needed to have something that was precisely defined. Others, like uh, the British, have chosen a completely different system, uh, which has all, have also its advantages, because they're coming from the other end of the spectrum. They can, they can, it's not well defined at all. The principles and the goals are exactly the same as the DMA, but the methodology is, is almost an inverse image because they want to be able to capture things without having to define it ex ante so that they can, they're more, they're more adaptable. My view is nobody knows what is the best system. You can see that there are a number of settings in which all system will be more efficient, a number of settings in which the British system will be more efficient. And uh, I think the value is in the diversity. So it's the coexistence between the two. If we manage to continue to align on the goals we're pursuing and to cooperate, that makes that for those, those behaviors that are not specifically tackled by the DMA. So therefore, we should have a 102 make your determination of an infringement to convention policy and then fit that back into the DMA, which would take years. Probably the DMU is more adapted. They will achieve results more quickly and we will be able in the European Union to build on these results in order to fit back into our DMA more quickly. For a number of other practices that are either those that are prohibited or close to those that are prohibited, it is likely that we will be quicker and the, our findings will allow colleagues in the UK to build on it in order to also be able to impose remedies or fines in the UK. So if we manage to have a good cooperation and I have no reason to believe we will not, we do already have a good cooperation. I think the, uh, the main asset here is precisely that we are diverse and that therefore together we cover efficiently the whole spectrum. So I'm sorry for this digression, I come back to the core of your question. So they're self-executing these provisions, they're very narrow uh, and they're associated with very, very severe punishment under the DMA for those firms that do not, that do not respect uh, these, the, the obligations. We can impose fines. Private enforcement can take place in front of national courts. And that will also uh, play a role. And we have a regulatory dialogue provided for by Article 8 of the DMA, and uh, which we see as an additional tool to ensure effective compliance um, uh, with the DMA. Even if this role is relatively uh, uh, limited, we have a discretion in whether to engage into regulatory uh, dialogue uh, or not. But as a follow-up question, uh, do you do you think, Olivia, uh, that uh, the Commission does have sufficient uh, competences to engage in regulatory dialogue, even uh, at least within the commitment decision? Because uh, one of the uh, in the original version of the DMA, the, the mechanism of commitments was there. Now we have it mainly for pretty much or only to systematic non-compliance. Would would wouldn't the Commission want a, a mechanism of commitment being more refined, where you can put forward on the table what you want uh, as a starting point, or you have sufficient room even with, with, within the existing mechanism of, of Regulation 1003 for commitments in export cases and uh, systematic non-compliance cases for D DMA plus regulatory dialogue within Article 8 of the DMA? Well, we think so. Uh, but of course, uh, the, the jury is still out. We, we, by definition, do not have a case yet. But we we built the system because this way because we thought it would be effective. But it has not been tested. So uh, let's see. I think one of the big uh, issue in DMA, like in antitrust, obviously, uh, will be how do we overcome the asymmetry of information uh, issue? 
Um, so, uh, and for this, uh, the problem is that there is a discrepancy in the, when you talk about the means in, uh, in prisons. I mean, I have received 20 people to enforce the DNA. I have doubled it because I have chosen to uh, agglomerate one of my anti-terrorist platforms unit into the DMA to make it 40. Uh, colleagues in, in DG Connect are also enforcing. Uh, and, and we need to keep it in the middle because the DMA is, of course, very much connected. I've talked quite a bit about it to, to regular antitrust on the one hand, but it is just equally connected to the rest of the regulatory framework, the part of the framework that is not asymmetric, but symmetric, very traditional uh, 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 regulatory framework, the latest iteration of which is, uh, is the DSA. Um, so you, you need to keep it in between. That plugs already part of the asymmetry of information. The other part needs to be plugged by third parties. I mean, it's the same in an antitrust investigation. I mean, there are a number of things. I don't have engineers, specialists of every field we're investigating, but third parties that are the potential uh, victims of the practices, they do. So they, they uncover the cards for you so that you understand better. Um, so the same goes for the DMA, of course. Uh, we will certainly need to uh, uh, muscle uh, or uh, uh, capacity in terms of uh, engineers and data scientists. As you saw, we have created uh, uh, a chief technology officer function in Digicom that mirrors a chief economist. Our chief economist has also reorientated its recruitment policy in order to have economists that are uh, or more economists that have specialists of, the, of, this, of this field. Um, so all this will come in place gently, and we will see whether it works. I mean, if it doesn't work, we'll need to adapt quickly and change. Uh, if we see that we are lagging behind, uh, that we cannot uh, effectively uh, preempt strategies from parties uh, um, to rig the market because we are too slow, we're not informed enough, etc., we will need to rethink our system. For the time being, we do believe it will be effective, and we have no reasons to believe that it will not, because we have not started implementing it. And you have done some really um, prudent precautionary filters, so to say, uh, such as kind of mandatory, uh, avoiding mandatory third parties with legitimate interests, contributions, submissions, because which would make your process in time much longer, or as well as not considering efficiency defense. You mentioned the UK Digital Markets Competition Consumers Bill, which contains uh, the efficient mandatory efficiency defense, which could be, I, in my view, I don't know how, how I imagine that making it uh, optional for the CMA would make completely different, would be on the country, make another room for regulatory dialogue. Uh, but the, the, the DMA doesn't have uh, neither mandatory nor, nor optional efficiency defense, and we understand the reasons. But let me move more to kind of DMA sociology, maybe perhaps. You observe that different uh, different gatekeepers, designated or not yet, uh, maybe invoke different strategies. Do you observe that they they, they are willing uh, maybe to, in, to use this tool also to enter into each other's markets and thus uh, using DMA uh, for inter-ecosystem competition. Some people say, well, oh, formalistically speaking, inter-ecosystem competition creates all this create work, makes this all creative tensions, which uh, drives innovation, et cetera, et cetera. And we as society are better off. Others say that it will be kind of elitist club of, of five, seven uh, strongest with making the room for new entrants, not even hypothetical. So it will be completely uh, eliminated because they will be just maturing each other. And these are obviously two polar views. Where in this uh, spectrum would you position your your, your vision on, on this um, most plausible uh, implication of, of, of the of, of robust enforcement of the DMA? Well, I'm a pragmatic, and I'm not a believer. I'm an agnostic. So uh, uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, I would say 
you're right. I mean, in a way, this world in which the the world is dominated by five, six, or seven players is already the world in which we live, correct? Um, and to a certain extent, uh, this ecosystem compete on some part of them, do not compete on other. I mean, it, it's a complex overlapping circle kind of uh, situation. The DMA doesn't care so much where the competition comes from. They care about keeping market open so that some, I mean, if you innovate, you stand your chance to disrupt the market. I mean, you remember in the beginning of the 20s, uh, 2000s, um, 25 years ago, when uh, I was uh, part of those that were working on the Microsoft case. Like Microsoft monopoly seemed like everlasting. And in a way, it is true, because 25 years later, you're still stuck with Windows, and that's about it, no? Uh, so that's true. But on the other hand, the relevance of Windows is not the same as it was 25 years ago. And that is because innovation took place. And what was, at the time, a sympathetic new entrant, sympathetic new entrant disrupting Windows became Google. Uh, and now we have to uh, care about the uh, inconveniences of having Google as such a big beast. Uh, and what matters is that innovators can reap the benefits of their innovation if they so wish and disrupt Google. And probably that would create another firm that will, at some point, will also enjoy market power. And we will have to. to, to 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 deal with because you know power corrupts. So the nice new entrant uh, with a few sympathetic bird wearing people in their garage somewhere on the west coast become a huge multinational trying to capture your data for money, uh, and that is in the natural order of things. And this is why back to your philosophical question in the beginning. Uh, people like me have a duty to take care of this type of things. Uh, so it, but my job is to keep things fluid so that innovation is not immediately captured by, by the incumbents in order either to kill it or to incorporate it very early into their ecosystem so that it further protects the core market they derive their market power from. Uh, uh, from being disrupted by 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 uh, by fringe competitors, so that's that's the that's the job, and uh, whether competition will come from uh, small and sympathetic uh, startups or whether it will come for the big beast uh, next, probably both. Uh, I don't know, and nobody knows. My job is to keep it open so that both can happen. And suddenly, uh, the small companies have a chance to grow and become a big a big beast as well. And obviously, as, as a genuine agnostic, you are equally agnostic to the jurisdiction where the newcomers, the disruptors, would potentially come from. I don't care. I couldn't care less. I mean, the, the DMA, uh, to make a... a explicit was is implicit in your question is not a protectionist tool targeted to US companies. I mean I would love to have 80% of the gatekeepers in scope being European firms. That's not the reality and that's not the reality for a number of reasons that we don't have time to discuss today but uh, uh, it so happens that these innovations happen in the United States. So these firms uh, were born and grew in the United States. And that's good. Uh, but in the end of the day, the DMA simply defines what we're ready to accept and not ready to accept here in Europe from these firms. And the firms are drawing the consequences. Some are deciding not to launch certain services here because the thing is too burdensome. 
Others are decided to restructure the way they do business globally because they don't want to be subjected to, well, they don't want to partition the way they're organizing their business. So they want to respect the DMA basically everywhere. And you have a number of other of, of other of other settings uh, that are that are possible, but that's the result of firm decisions in front of a regulation. That's neither the intent nor the mechanical consequence of the existence of that regulation. Thank you very much, Olivia, for this. I have two questions on methodology. One is related to more kind of economic or analysis of, of competition, and one is more on, on Leo. The first one concerns the rapidly evolving theory of ecosystem uh, within the digital and beyond. And we hear people who say that because the markets are so complex, uh, we need uh, this, this uh, reference to strategic management literature in order to understand these complexities in greater detail and thus uh, enrich our knowledge, uh, epistemological argument. The, the other side of the spectrum say that we just got rid from market from the, the burden of market definition and we somehow try to um, bring to the antitrust uh, agenda something which appears to be even more complex, even more it's kind of butterfly effect. Everything depends on everything else. How on, how on earth we are expected to understand the nitty-gritty and it should be used uh, and it's likely that it will be used as defense rather than uh, for pure understanding the, the nature of things. Again, these are two extremes. Where would you position your views within this? If this is an, if these two extremes are... Um, well, okay. On the one hand, I don't think ecosystems theories are so new. Well, think a bit about the first uh, Microsoft case, you know, the browser. Uh, so Microsoft, I mean, beginning of the internet, mid nineties, Netscape invents the browser as we know it, because before that you needed to be uh, uh, really gifted in uh, coding and ping on uh, MS-DOS and all these type of things. Uh, and all of a sudden it's very simple. Uh, if you know the IP address of a service, then you get access to it. And on that basis, of course, search engines and, uh, and all this. So Netscape invents this function, creates that market, get 90% of the world market. Microsoft decides to embed the same project, except a bit less performing, into, into Windows. And that kills Netscape in less than a year. Well, that's exactly an ecosystem theory of ARM. Uh, so you use your, your the fact that you control a core market that gives access to anything anything you would be willing to put on a computer in order to uh, monopolize another market that is neither really downstream or upstream is say adjacent same way the in microsoft again 25 years ago microsoft has a monopoly on windows so a monopoly on any on any pc access they decide to uh, uh, grow into mini server uh, operating systems. In the beginning, of course, to do that, they give a perfect interface to uh, all the mini server uh, other systems than theirs. So you can plug into the computer and use your mini server, and it works very well. And then as Microsoft NT develops into the small server market, Gradually, it is still as easy to use your Windows computer with Microsoft NT and more and more complicated and buggy to use it with other uh, others. So they're downgrading progressively the operability and they gain uh, a, powerful, uh, a powerful position on the mini server market, from which moment they start to attack the bigger server market and do exactly the same. That's also an ecosystem theory of form. So ecosystems theory of form are really nothing new. They're simply more complicated today because the number of adjacent markets, the number of interactions is more is more important, but in this and the number of multi-sided markets, which interferes with each other, giving rise to a multitude of potential competitive relationships, 
makes it very complicated to analyze. But at the essence, it's the same. Uh, so I don't think that is really the issue. I think the issue is different. The issue is what I would call entrenchment. So the conditions in which this multitude of uh, 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 connections in, uh, in ecosystems create competitive problems that are difficult to analyze in the traditional uh, you know, uh, ability, incentives, potential effects uh, framework. A good example of this, I think, is the recent uh, prohibition in uh, um, in booking e-traveling. Because actually, it's interesting. It's it's a non-horizontal merger. It's booking, so dominant players on the OTA market for uh, hotels uh, reservation, is buying another platform that is providing some service for for flight booking and wants to integrate the two. One of the things that is interesting in this case is that although it's a non, it's a non horizontal merger, the projection of booking itself in its internal documents is that it will give rise, it, give, it will conduct, sorry, will lead to a rise in uh, the market share of booking on its market for hotel uh, reservations by a quite significant percentage point, market on which it is already very dominant. It is relatively unusual that uh, uh, a non-horizontal market uh, uh, leads you to an increase on short-term increase on market, uh, on market share. Uh, and that suggests something. And actually that suggests that the in these ecosystems, consumers are relatively sticky. Once they have entered the ecosystem, they will not exit. And actually, if you capture some of them you did not capture before through the entry through flight reservations rather than hotel reservation, you will have a volume of consumers that you would not have captured before that not only you capture, but will stay with you at the time to book the hotel. In other words, through this, it's not a, necessarily a traditional foreclosure, or it can be, but it's entrenchment. This acquisition raises further the barriers to entry onto the core market from which you derive your power. E, for that reason, we do believe it strengthens your position, the, uh, the dominant position. Uh, that's, that is the first case that we articulate this. Of course, it will, I have little doubts, it will go to court. So the court will have to, to decide not only whether this is correct to analyze this as a certain of the mission, but what is the burden of proof? Uh, so we shall see. But my view is that it's difficult to see how competition authorities could not be uh, worried about such situations and intervene. Because indeed, and that's that this is for me where the ecosystem issue is the most interesting. It's not so much when you have a very traditional leverage and uh, and uh, uh, foreclosure story, because that is simply more complicated, but it's the same stuff that we always had. This is different, and this is very idiosyncratic to the data economy. And uh, that is, I, I, I think, what is interesting, really. But you would obviously uh, apply it mainly or only to exposed cases uh, analysis. That is difficult to apply ex ante. Um, because ex ante, nothing has happened. So that that projects us into another very well to put it very intense discussion at the moment in the competition world about the so-called new market uh tool uh the way the the brits have 
which allows the competition authority to analyze the market structure, decide that is suboptimal in terms of competition, and intervene although there is no infringement. Actually, intervene before any infringement has taken place. That, on the one hand, is uh, in particular in markets like digital that are tipping very quickly, and then once they have tipped, it's over, is very powerful. On the other hand, I don't know if you have ever read the uh, uh, minority uh, report by uh, uh, Philip K. Dick or seen the movie, but it's the same. I mean, you put people in jail before they have committed the murder. Uh, and it's, well, this is very, very intrusive. Uh, um, so it's not exactly that, because of course, there is no individual sanction. But you intervene into the, the structure of the market for, for uh, uh, competition to achieve better your competition goals. Um, I'm not saying it's not a good tool. I'm just saying it needs to be refined a little bit. Because in the end of the day, for me, it is acceptable only if it ends up being competition-inspired regulation in markets in which competition doesn't work well in the absence of regulation. So in a way, the DMA is a kind of small version of, of this in the case that seemed to us to be the most obvious and therefore in which this intrusion would be the most acceptable. And this leads me perfectly to the second question, uh, namely, I, I wanted to ask, you basically positioned the DMA somewhere in between the DMCC uh, or even the current uh, regime of, of market investigations, where you, are, as an enforcer, are expected to tailor, to, to, to create a pro-competition regime, and thus you are not applying the responsive approach, it's a more kind of um, demiurgial uh, understanding of what you want to achieve and uh, as you said minority report and you put you, you you put obligations and liability actually before before anything harmful has been done but they may also does have some elements of this with with, with, catalog, with offering the catalog of obligations which some people say are punitive ipso facto but that's not my question my question is more specific we transposed the 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 the, the, the toolkit of, of revelation 1003 in terms of uh, administrative uh, administrative um, uh, matters, uh, which was quite understandable, revolutionary, helpful tool for for discover discover discovering new evidence uh, for uh, for exposed rules. Do you think that we will we need such proactive uh, interventionist measures uh, in, on, on site of enforcement in order to identify instances of non-compliance? Uh, and thus, as, as a side effect, we have this reference to quasi-criminal nature and thus due process would somehow slow down. If we put, can we put these two things on scale at all? Or these are two completely different dimensions and one doesn't, is not dependent on the other. And if we can put it on scale, which one would you put more priority to? Well, firstly, I, I, I don't think one can qualify it as quasi-criminal. Um, there is no jail sentencing for firms. There is no personal responsibility. Frankly, it is simply a regulation. Uh, and the regulation says, well, if you've been designated because you're so big and you have so much power, there's a number of things uh, that you cannot do. And actually, 90% of, uh, of these provisions are things that you know you cannot do because we repeatedly sanction you, except uh, invariably too late. Um, so that is that's so much for the quasi uh, 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 criminal nature. Now, the second aspect of your question, I guess, is how do we well, is it legitimate, if I, if I understand well, is it legitimate to uh, have transposed all the powers, et cetera, that we have in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the antitrust onto uh, the DMA and uh, 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 use it ex ante? 
Well, there is a there is a fluid relationship between antitrust and the DMA. So the DMA in itself, let's assume for the sake of this discussion that firms will not grossly infringe the prohibitions on obligation. So they will do their best to respect it. And I think that is the situation, the, 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 what, is, what is going to happen. Um, these are the signal, the firms are engaging, they do everything so that on the 7th of March morning, the, the obligations they have to comply with are complied with. Now, that of course doesn't settle the issue because as I said, these obligations are very narrow. So they can play around. I mean, the likelihood is they will still try to maximize profit. And some of the things they are now prevented from doing are huge cash cows. Legitimately, they will try to find a way to maximize the profit without infringing the regulation. And uh, it may be that this ends up doing things that achieve exactly the same results as what is prohibited, except through other means. And this is where we will need to, if it's relatively close to what is prohibited, maybe we can use anti-circumvention mechanisms in the DMA. It is, if it's a bit uh, further away, uh, we will have to go for Article 102, or maybe we can build on the finding of the UK or, uh, or uh, the Australians uh, on the basis of that DMU-like uh, uh, approach. We don't know. Uh, things are fluid. How all this will unfold and plays out is, uh, is, largely, uh, is largely unknown. Yeah, just a clarify, to, for, to clarify a little bit, my, 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 my main kind of concern or hypothetical concern rather, do we need such interventionist measures, uh, competences like down, down raiding, for example, in order to discover uh, instances of non-compliance? Of course. Uh, when we when we do open this door, we care the quasi-criminal references of, uh, of due diligence and thus it can complicate the process if we put these two on scale. Yeah, well... Yes, we do, because then you would need to be very granular on the list of obligations and the and the uh, prohibitions. Some of them you can see very easily whether they comply or not. Some of them, assuming of course, they would not be frontally non complied with. It would be more subtle. It would be implemented in a way that is suboptimal. It would be, and there you enter into the area of the huge asymmetry of informations, the things that you can hide in your coding. The as a, already today in Exposed, we discover things that we did not necessarily uh, suspected. When we look at the internal uh, exchange of emails, minutes of internal meetings, et cetera, in firms, there is absolutely no reason why it would be different for the DMA. Actually, the incentive, if you can cheat the DMA without being detected, it's very good, no? You continue to profit maximize, you're a good corporate citizen, you have kind of the DMA seal that tells your customers, I'm great, I'm a friend of competition, and in reality, you're not. So, of course, we need all the normal arsenal of the uh, investigation tool in order to unveil it, not so much because we would use it, but because we could use it. And this is what disciplines the market. I'll tell you a story before finishing. 15 years ago, I was uh, a case manager in, uh, in merger control. And I had observed over, over the years that the discipline of firms and lawyers in honestly and candidly disclosing internal documents, in particular when they were not exactly compliant with the story they were telling us, was less and less. So, 
I've been waiting for a case in which I had really strong suspicions and I did something we had never done before and we did, never did after. We carried out a dumb raid in a merger case. And we didn't find anything that uh, would lead to sanctions for the company. But at least for the four to five years after, cooperation by lawyers in obtaining all the internal documents was a lot better. So the fact that you could access it directly at any point in time, for example, through a down rate, has a disciplining effect. And uh, frankly, the asymmetry of means, I told you we are 40 in Digicom. For any case of uh, normal magnitude, this is at least the number of people that are lined up on the other side, most often more than 100. So there is this asymmetry. There is a huge and kind of natural asymmetry of information. If we do not have serious investigative power, there is no way firms will have the self-discipline to comply and complying with the disclosure orders they receive uh, because they will legitimately think, well, how could they know? So it's, it's a free invitation to lie or not to answer candidly to the questions or not to disclose the documents. The only way to make sure that doesn't happen is that you can access to it yourself at any point in time. This is very convincing. I'm very glad I asked this clarificatory question. Mm -hmm. Before moving to the last question, uh, which we have traditionally asked our guests uh, about their recommendations to students, I have another one, which is kind of more topical. Um, namely, we, we are in this electoral cycle uh, and we are approaching to the new European election. So I wanted to ask you, Maybe several questions within this one uh, framework. Do you, from your observation uh, as an experienced experience senior uh, antitrust enforcer, um, how how significant the impact of the electoral results are on changing the directions, priorities, vision of 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 competition of the Commission more general and uh, competition enforcement uh, uh, Digicomp more more specifically. And what, what do you think, uh, obviously it's not crystal ball, and, uh, do you think, what is at stake at least within these elections? What are potential uh, outcomes? Where would the European competition policy could potentially move? Well, I don't know is the answer, but the, um, you know, competition policy is constitutional in Europe. It's in the treaty. So under treaty can only be changed through unanimity. There are 70 years of case law. So, or 60 years rather. So, I mean, it's, you know, the foundations are rather solid. And of course, at the same time, competition policy adapts. I mean, competition policy today uh, is not the same as 10 years ago because things are changing. Competition policy has adapted to the COVID crisis. It has adapted to the energy crisis. And, and it's right to do so because competition policy is one of the policies uh, in the toolbox of, uh, of, of a sovereign power. So it's not alien to the rest of the policies. It's not here hanging in the vacuum. Uh, uh, kind of immune of what happens in the rest of the world. And, and so competition policy works, first of all, within the field defined by the legislator. So if a market has a specific organization that has been decided by the legislator, it's not for competition policy to, to second guess it. Competition policy should try to influence that regulatory framework so that it is the more pro-competitive possible but then once is there is there and competition policy make tries to make market work within the boundaries of that regulation that's that's our job the second thing we discussed about environment is that competition policy has to take into account a number of externalities uh, because they're relevant to 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 the job and also competition there is a time dimension to competition Let's take resiliency. Resiliency is a 
is a legitimate objective for industrial policy. We want to have a, an industry in Europe that is competitive, decarbonated, and resilient. Short term, a number of things that you would qualify as efficiencies in, in competition policy are playing against resilience. Take, take a very simple example. Um, just in time. Just in time is one of the efficiencies you can achieve through a merger or an agreement or et cetera, et cetera. You save a lot of cost on an ongoing basis. But of course, the reality is that the costs you're saving on an ongoing basis, they are potential hidden costs, all piled in one moment in time, if ever something happens that disrupts your, 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 your supply chain. In other words, it is an arbitrage between uh, long term and short term. Uh, also, the risks you're ready to take, uh, the chances that uh, uh, of incidents of something that supplies your, your supply chain, if you, if you think they're very, very, very remote, uh, so you think your best profit maximizing posture is actually to ignore that possibility and go for as much rationalization of your supply chain as you can. If you think it's not completely unlikely, maybe you make another arbitrage, you see. Uh, so the time horizon is something that plays when you consider competition. Look at the organization of uh, electricity markets, for example. For long, we were told that competition is about what, how the price formation on the spot markets. That is true, but that is not the only truth. You could very well have a world more resilient in which partly you have this because you will in, in any case needs to have the necessity. I mean, you will need to have a minimum of liquidity in the market with instant price formation, so spot markets. But you could imagine to have a string of uh, longer term contracts standardized three years, five years, seven years, 10 years, that you trade on a secondary market that are exchanged on an exchange and compensated on a central clearing platform. Would competition, uh, would that be a, a model in which competition would work less? No, it would work differently. And it would be more resilient. So what I mean to say by these examples is that there is not only one competition policy, there are an infinity of competition policy, depending on your goals, depending on your values, different, and, and depending on how you see uh, the trade-offs between all these variables, uh, which are positive and negative externalities. Um, and this is, this is, these are the inputs with which you craft your competition policy. But there is no truth in that. There are only value judgments. Indeed. Mm. After all, it's a policy. Uh, mm. And as policy choices are... In, 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 exactly. In, what is different is the way you deal with cases. Because when you deal with cases, then you have an absolute obligation. It's quasi-judicial. You deal with everybody the same way. But the policy with which you deal all, with all these cases, then you have a lot of latitude. My last question, Olivia, uh, is related to, to recommendations. We understand that the Commission, the GCOM, has never had a shortage of talent. You have this privileged position to, to select uh, new members of staff. And I would obviously ask for, for recipe for, for, for the trainees and others, uh, student graduates who, who wanted to join the GCOM in this excited time. But you definitely observe different trends um, and, and how the, the, the market is, is changing, what skills, competences are needed, and what may be typical mistakes you, 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 you noted from, from, from young, uh, young potential uh, office uh, practitioners or policymakers, enforcers. What would be your recommendation to, to, to those who enter in this profession in such excited, exciting time? To be different. Because the, the, the market is very competitive. Right? The market to come to the GCOMP 
that also the market to join uh, the large law firms uh, in that field or the large economic consultancies. It's a very competitive market where, I mean, people need really to have the, the best skills, competencies, graduation for uh, uh, the best universities. It's not enough to, today to, have, to be graduated or even a very good university. You need to master three languages, um, etc. But all this is kind of a given. This is this is a mandatory requirement. So you should expect that all the people you will compete with to join DG competition, they will speak at least three languages. They will have they will be bright. They will have graduated from the best universities, and then we'll have the basic core skills that we expect in either law or economy. So the question is, how do you differentiate? And you differentiate by being different. The, the value of, uh, well, I, I need to explain briefly how we work in the GCO. We're a flat organization because we have to make very complex decisions with very big consequences, with a stress on our resources, so not enough people usually, and in very little time. So how do you achieve that? We're trying to minimize your rate of errors. You pull all the brains you have in the same room and you, you brainstorm. And that means from the newcomer that was a student just a few months before to the director general. And we analyze the problem. We take the number of hours that is necessary. We sketch the various options. We weight the pros and cons and in a way there is in that part of the exercise there is no hierarchy if i say something that doesn't hold i expect my people to say well respectfully of course as i would be respectful to them i don't think that works for this and that reason and maybe they're right and maybe they're wrong anyway that triggers a discussion usually nobody's really right or wrong usually they have a very good point and we end up elsewhere than where each of us was in the beginning of the discussion that's how we work. That's how we 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 shape cases, and uh, in that exercise, it's important, of course, to come with the sharpest legal or economic analysis. But it's almost equally important to come from a different angle. Uh, so the, the 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 person that has real value is the person that will come with a point of view on the issue we are discussing that no one else in the group had because otherwise it's simply it's whether you you're sharpest quickest than the others but in the end of the day we all mainstream i made my career by being mainstream and quick but the guys that really but, but people like me we were many a bit sharper, a little bit less, depending on what you have been doing the night before. But uh, the real value to the organization, the, the, the jewels, the guy that when you see one, you say, no, this one I want to pick, is the one that comes with something else. Be it before he or she studied something else. You know, the best people I've seen in, in merger control were coming from Oxford and had studied Roman history and Latin. But they had a very good brain. And they came with questions. First of all, they were daring to ask questions that if you were a trained economist, you would not have. They said, it's stupid. They didn't care. They said, simply just, I don't understand this point. They don't, and, they would, and they were right most of the time because this is something that we all took for granted and they didn't. So be different. Of course, you must have the minimum, but it's not on the minimum that you will differentiate. You will differentiate because you did some, something else. A last anecdote. When I, when I was very young, just out of the university, my first job was in the private sector in a very prestigious luxury good firm. And I was not, I was not getting out of the best, best, best university. Good, but not top. And usually they would rather recruit top. And they recruited me. 
So I asked the uh, people in charge of HR, the director in charge of HR, why me? And the answer was, because you did all of your study while making your living by playing jazz in clubs at night. So, which is true. Uh, and he said, well, that tells us several things. That tells us that uh, you can sleep very little. That tells us that you have a, a artistic sensitivity. That tells us, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why we took you. And maybe we will sack you after six months because on the core, you don't have what we need. But we need to assemble this mix of heterogeneity that avoids that we make mistakes. It's the same in digital. We need to have the, all the core, but we need to come from different perspectives because that's the best insurance against uh, making silly decisions. This is amazing uh, advice and, and stories. Olivia Harsum, thank you very much indeed for this for this illuminating conversation. Uh, I learned a lot, and I'm sure uh, our viewers will will also reciprocate and join in me uh, to, to thank you for for your time and for your brilliant ideas. That's my pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk, and good luck to the students. <laughs>